I'm Brayden Lane. Well, technically, I'm actually an animated avatar. But I'm giving today's talk on the Portaprog, a portable ISP and UDPI programmer for both development and production. Let's get into it. In January of 2019, I actually hadn't done any electronics. Not any circuit design, not any schematics. I knew what a resistor was from high school, but that was about the extent of it. And I had this idea for a toy, a little robot I called the Screamsy. The toy kids love and parents hate. And why I tagged it that, if you can imagine for a moment, a little robot toy that responds to sound. The volume of the sound controls the robot speed. The pitch of the sound controls the robot's direction. Now give this toy to a seven-year-old. The Screamsy is an ESP8266 based robot with a little motor controller and it supports both audio control and a little web app that I created. The web app is actually quite enjoyable. You can take a group of Screamsies, put them together and play a game we call Screamsy Soccer. But here you can actually experience firsthand why parents might hate this toy. Wow! Wow! One thing I learned in creating the Screamsy and creating my own printed circuit boards is you can actually repurpose them. So I took the same controller without the audio input but with the web application support and created Big Red. All of this led me to what my real idea was, a challenge coin for the InfoSec and Advanced Technologies communities. Imagine for a moment you've got a challenge coin but it's electronic. And so you have the ability to do various puzzles, cryptography, uh, various things like that would be possible with the challenge coin. And that was my idea for what became the e-challenge coin. Now, the e-challenge coin did not start out looking anything like what my idea was. But eventually, I was able to test out the idea for the touch sensors, the LEDs, the other controls, and get to my very first prototype, which didn't work. Which led me to my second prototype, which kind of didn't work, but with a few bodges, I was able to make it function. And then finally to the third prototype, and here we actually get to see the ATmega 328PB, the LEDs, and the resistors, but I noticed I was starting to run out of space. I had to modify my expectations of 0805 components down to 0603s. And then here we have the final e-challenge coin, the production model. One challenge coin wasn't enough. Eventually, I created 240 e-challenge coins, all by hand. Programming these was a challenge in and of itself. I created the Portable ISP programmer for this purpose. It was specifically for ISP chips like the ATmega328PB, but it also worked on ATtiny chips. And I created a series of ornaments. I create one new ornament each year, the first being the bell. That was followed by the snowman, and then now most recently the tin soldier. And these all use ATtiny13s. And here's the original portable ISP, built using a TTGO 18650, and the only modification that had to be made was one capacitor was added to it, um, and then a series of wires to get me my little breakout header at the end. The interface of the portable ISP uses a single button, and you can see it here is green, and actually that just is a plastic push button that activates a button that's already on the printed circuit board. So the portable ISP required no custom hardware to create what we have here. I did create a series of jigs and cables that make it easier for working with various projects. Here's an example of me using the portable ISP. This is a QFP32 adapter, simply plugged in, and to place the chip in it, press the button to start the programming process, it loads the firmware to the chip, and then it goes through the process of verifying the, uh, the flash process. and it's ready to flash another chip. So this is how I was able to flash a series of chips each day I was working on these. When I started the 2021 e-challenge coin, 
I needed UDPI support, while the portable ISP was only SPI support. So I started working on the code to create the Portaprog, and the initial first version of the Portaprog looked exactly like the portable ISP. Then I started to think about how I was going to do test because the test on the original eChallenge coin was a very manual task. None of it could be automated. And so I started looking at alternatives. And so I went to the next version of the uh, TT Go. This gave me a little scrolling display with a joystick. But what I really wanted was I wanted a larger screen. And so I started trying out other pre-existing hardware. And while the large screen on the right worked very well, it required a lot of modification to the board. Eventually I settled on the Portaprog using a TTGO T-Display. In addition to the cables that I've created for the Portaprog, I've developed a jig design. It uses a reusable base with two different clamping locations and then interchangeable adapters. And each time I create a new project, I create an adapter for that project. The command set for the Portaprog evolved over time. Initially, I focused on the programming capabilities, the ability to send flash firmware to the Portaprog, the ability to flash a device from the Portaprog, store the firmware to the local file system on the Portaprog so that I would be able to use it at a later date, uh, interrogate and set the fuses, and potentially deal with the EEPROM, being able to read and write that information as well. That expanded to then being able to do some various configuration of a UART interface between the Portaprog and an attached device, as well as interrogating a chip to find out what its memory capabilities, its version, its type information is available, and some configuration information, the ability to detect a chip that's attached, get information about that chip, manually specify that the Portaprog should be working in UDPI mode versus SPI mode, and setting up the UART between the Portaprog and the attached device. This led me to wanting to do test automation, and a number of other commands started to evolve, and the Portaprog command set grew very quickly. The ability to power on and off the device, send UART messages to the device in query of UART messages coming back from the device. Also, since the Portaprog had some available buttons, I wanted to be able to customize and configure those for any particular application. Very early in the Portaprog development process, I settled on an architecture for how the memory was going to be processed and how information was going to flow between the various endpoints so our computer, our Portaprog, and our attached device, and information would flow between them. I decided that I wanted the flow to only occur between two points at a time. So while the Portaprog has local storage, it also has an in-memory buffer. So communication between the computer and the Portaprog would be between the communication and the in-memory buffer. Portaprog to the device would be the in-memory buffer to the device and the Portaprog and its local storage would be in memory to local storage. So the memory is always used as sort of a way station for the information. This actually has a number of benefits. Performance is one of them, but also data validation is another. So a typical development scenario, information is sent from the computer as a stream to the Portaprog and it's stored in memory. Then a write command will take that information from memory and send it out to the device. To program a device off-site using the Portaprog in standalone, the firmware is loaded from the file system to in-memory, and then from memory to the device. To pull information from a device, it's read from the device to the in-memory buffer, and then it can either be stored from memory to the local file system, or it can be received by the computer. And finally, in a production environment, information is loaded from the file system to memory, and then because it's stored in memory and it persists, it can be written to a device, a new attached device, written again, a new attached device, written again, repeat, repeat, repeat. Let's take a look at a development scenario with the Portaprog. So here we have an example. This is the 2021 eChallenge coin and its dice demo. The dice demo is actually pretty simple. Uh, waits for the user to touch one of the touch sensors to determine whether it's going to be doing a randomization of a one-sided die through an eight-sided die. Once that's done, it will go and begin an animation. The animation is on the coin itself using the LEDs. The animation progresses and it gradually starts to slow down. And then when it reaches a lower threshold, the animation will stop and the randomized die value will be displayed using one of the LEDs and text information is output on the UART from the device. So the Portaprog is actually able to receive that UART information and display it on its screen. 
For development, I use Platform IO in conjunction with VS Code, and Platform IO actually has an option for a custom upload command. So I'm able to integrate this directly with the Portaprog. You can see here we set the device type to UDPI, then we echo the send command to the Portaprog, followed by cat and the source code. This is the stream information that gets uploaded to the device. And then finally, we execute the write command, which takes it from the in-memory buffer of the Portaprog and puts it out onto the uh, device itself. And we see here in the upper corner, that's actually a screenshot of the Portaprog screen. It has done the write, it does the verify, and then it's done, and it can be uh, tested directly on the device. It's also possible to set up the Portaprog if it's plugged into a USB port to have the information that's coming from the device to the Portaprog over UART be echoed from the Portaprog to your computer. The Portaprog is configured at one baud rate to talk to the device, in this case it's 9600 baud, but to your computer it's talking at a different speed, and so the monitor speed here is set at uh, 115 200. So now when we execute the same task of doing the upload to the Portaprog and then a write to the device, we'll see that it goes through the process of uh, sending the code to the Portaprog. The Portaprog then will start the write process, followed by the verify process, and then any other output from the coin, so in this case those UART messages we had, will be displayed on the device, but they will also be echoed back to the computer here. So you see the device has been set to UDPI, it has received, the Portaprog has received the appropriate code, and now let's jump over to the terminal, and we'll be able to see the UART information we can see here that it's still proceeding with the write. The write is finished. Now it's doing the verify task. And if you remember in our demo, what happens is the user touches one of the touch sensors and that determines what side die it's going to roll. And then it'll start a randomizing process. And then it will actually have come up with the values. And then we have it. We've gone through, we've done a couple of tests. And that information is actually going from the device to the Portaprog, being displayed on the Portaprog screen, but then it's also being echoed through the UART back to the computer. Kind of handy when you're doing development. Taking a look at the Portaprog device itself, there's three programmable buttons across the top, and then there's also a navigation button, or the navigation rocker. This will allow us to move through menus. I can also scroll backwards through the virtual viewport display buffer that's available, and then a press of the middle uh, short press versus long press will have two different actions. So here we're just going through and we're going to navigate uh, through the various files. These are the files that are currently on this Portaprog. There's three uh, firmware files, Ornament, Snowman, and Bell. And we can either flash those, we can delete them, or we can turn to the previous menu. So let's go through the process of just deleting these files. So here it's pretty easy. We just do a delete, we do a long press. We select the file again, we move down to delete, and we do a long press, and we've deleted all the files that are currently on this Portaprog. I've shown you the various ornament projects I have. There's actually four files here. So I have a smoke test that works on any ornament, and then there's the production code for the three ornaments I currently have available, the snowman, the bell, and the soldier. So this one file will go through the process of removing any existing files from the Portaprog, and then it'll go through the process of uploading and storing the, the new firmware. So the send command is sending from the computer to the Portaprog. Then we follow that by the cat command, which is actually just streaming the hex file. And then finally we do a store and a file name so that it gets saved to the Portaprog's flash storage. Executing the command, we'll actually be able to see the information arrive on the Portaprog screen. So the upload is going to first do the deletes, and then it's going to follow that by doing the upload of each of the firmware. Of course, we've already deleted the files, so those deletes generate errors. And then we see that we've received and stored, received and stored, received and stored repeatedly for the files that are now uploaded to that device. We can take a quick look and actually see that those files are on the device. We can do a directory of the Portaprog. In addition to doing a directory of the Portaprog, we can do a cat command on a file. Here we are looking at the config file. The Wi-Fi is Skynet, be careful. And uh, the port is the port for all the commands being sent to it. That's customizable. The baud rate refers to the communication between the Portaprog and the attached device. And then we can also specify uh, script commands or even script files to the three programmable buttons. I often refer to the Portaprog as my bench buddy. So when it's not at my computer, it's over at my bench and I use it when I'm doing production work. So for instance, if I'm making a batch of 10 ornaments, uh, I will have it set up so I can just quickly flash the smoke test onto each one of the 10 
verify that they've uh, been assembled correctly, and then flash final firmware. And the process is very quick because the firmware gets loaded into memory from the onboard storage, and then it simply goes from memory out to the device, repeat, repeat, repeat. I've created a tag connect cable for my port prog and my ornaments all have the footprint for the tag connect on them. These ornaments use an ATtiny13, so the firmware is about 1K. The file, of course, is larger because it's in hex ASCII format. And so button one will do a write command. So we attach it to the ornament, press the write command, press the write command, press the write command, and repeat right down the line. And just like that, we have programmed all 10 of these with the final production firmware. The pre-production version of the Portaprog is using a TTGO T-Display ESP32 with battery charge capability. The Portaprog itself is a receiver board with a few additional components. To combine the two together, there are a few bodges. Let's take a look at those. Looking at the component side of the board, let's dive into which modifications I had to make to the TTGO to be able to be used as a Portaprog. The first modification I make deals with the LDO of the board. So the LDO has an enable resistor which is tied to the voltage source, whether that be USB or battery. Anytime either is connected, the board is active and live. To be able to have an on-off switch, I remove this resistor. The second modification is to remove a pair of coupling capacitors that tie together GPIO pins. Collectively, these two capacitors affect four different GPIO pins that we're going to be using. That concludes the modifications to the TTGO. Now let's look at how we actually combine it with the Portaprog board itself. So we removed that LDO resistor. What we're going to do is R1 is actually a replacement for that resistor, and then we tie a wire from that resistor pad down to TP1. This is actually the enable pin of the LDO. TP1 then connects to the switch 5, and that's how we get our power switch to work. So the power switch basically ties the voltage source back through R1 and back up to the LDO. Next, we need a lot of GPIO pins. GPIO 36 through 39 on an ESP32 do not have pull-up resistors, so I use a resistor network to provide pull-ups to all four of those GPIO pins. While I'm at it, I also add resistors for RX and TX of the UART connection. That's R3 and R4. Finally, R2 is a bridge resistor between the RX and TX used for UDPI. So the process of creating a UDPI is, since it's a one-wire serial interface, you take RX and TX, you bridge them with a resistor, and then you take the RX side as your UDPI. So the receive is unattenuated and the transmit is attenuated. The final thing I add is a MOSFET, and that is to control power to the attached device. I found that I was having voltage bleed through on UART and other pins, and so if many of the pins from the Portaprog were connected to the device, even if I shut off VCC to the device, it would still often have just enough power in a low power mode to operate. This MOSFET actually switches the ground side of the pins to the attached device. Up to this point, we've dealt with the programming and interaction between the Portaprog and an attached device. For this set of capabilities, the existing hardware from the portable ISP would be sufficient, and I may actually go through the process of porting the code that I currently have back to that hardware. One of the reasons is that hardware is readily available, and the price of that hardware has not changed much. Anyone looking for a Portaprog primarily for programming capability, that would be flashing firmware and modifying fuses, this hardware is sufficient, and it works great on the bench, as demonstrated when I did the programming of the ornaments. The limiting factor on these two TTGO boards is the OLED display. Its resolution is insufficient for doing any real test automation on the display. However, the one with the joystick does have PS RAM, which would allow for larger buffers for larger chips. Moving forward, we're now going to look at the scripting capability and the abilities for doing test automation. The Portaprog source code actually generates its README file and its online documentation. 
So in addition to all of the commands being available on the port prog using its help command, all that information in extended form is available on the open source at GitLab Braden Lane port prog The command set is broken up into a series of categories, the first one being configuration. That would be setting up the port prog for communication with the attached device, so that would be things like the baud rate, is it a UDPI chip, is it an SPI chip. There's also commands for detecting what kind of chip is attached, interrogating it for its information, storage, EEPROM, that kind of information. There's a series of file commands for interacting with the port prog You can get a directory of the files that are currently stored on the port prog You can delete those files. You can actually ask it to list those files. Then there are a set of commands for the I.O. with the attached device. This would be reading and writing the firmware to the device, interacting with its uh, EEPROM, and setting and checking fuses are also available. The I.O. commands are extended to moving data, so the moving operations we've seen before, moving from the computer to the in-memory buffers of the port prog from the port prog out to an attached device, down to the file system, from the file system to in-memory. There are also commands for sending a command file from the computer to the port prog and storing it, and also loading a command file from the local storage and executing it. When sending firmware from a computer to the port prog it uses the Intel hex or i8 hex file format, and the port prog processes that and verifies it when it stores it in memory. In memory, it's stored as binary, and then it's converted back to hex format when it's written out to the file system. The AVR commands are specific to the device, so the ability to read the fuses from the attached device and report them back, set fuses, with the exception of the locking bits. I made a mistake once, and so I no longer allow the port prog to execute lock bits. Erasing an attached device, writing new firmware to the attached device, reading the firmware from it into memory, and the read operation is actually smart. It will read the entire chip, and then it scans backwards from the end of the buffer that it just read until it finds uninitialized data. So it does a, it tries to be as smart as possible to come up with what size the actual firmware is. You can also read and write to EEPROM if the device has such a thing. And then there's power commands, and these are kind of helpful. You'll notice here that it does, again, refer to the S-ground, so that MOSFET is controlling the ground side of the circuit. It can be turned on and off or just toggled. The power commands were created for two reasons. The first was, there were instances where I did not want the device to start executing immediately after it had been written and verified. The second case is during development, if I want to restart the device, I can just do a quick power cycle. The command set also includes the ability to set the scripts that are going to be executed by the three programmable buttons. These can be assigned individual commands, a string of commands, or a command file. When I started to use the port prog for doing test automation, the script command set grew to include a set of commands for interacting with the port prog display as well as interacting with the attached device. The clear and text commands affect the port prog itself, so you're able to clear the display and put up an informational text message. Might be helpful for a test engineer. There is also a uclear and utext. These actually affect the attached device, so you clear would clear anything that's in the buffer that may have come from the attached device to the port prog The utext command sends text from the port prog through to the attached device. The utext command can be used in conjunction with the test command. Utext would send a piece of text from the port prog to the attached device. Test then monitors the UART for a text string in the return, and it can wait up to a certain period of time. During that period of time, it'll continue to look for the text. Any text that doesn't match is discarded. If it finds a match, then it returns immediately. Otherwise, it will wait for the timeout. The mute commands were late additions to the port prog command set. They prevent any internal message of the port prog being rendered on the display. This is helpful during test automation so that the test script is the only information being displayed on the port prog The port prog config file stores information about attaching to the local Wi-Fi, the port for its various command operations, baud rate for the attached device, timeout for the messages from the attached device, the initial power state of the attached device, an optional script file that will be run every time the port prog first starts up. 
and then default assignments for the various buttons. A new portaprog does not have a config file. So the documentation provides the most common commands for uploading a config file from Windows and from Linux. If there is no config file, the portaprog creates its own Wi-Fi hotspot to allow these to be uploaded. Also, if a portaprog is away from its configured Wi-Fi, it will also create its own hotspot. The current portaprog hardware is using a TTGO T display with a 240 by 135 color display. It uses all three serial ports and two SPI interfaces. Serial 2 is used for UDPI, and that requires a 4.7K resistor connected between the RX and TX pins, with the RX pin being the unified connection for UDPI. That's because UDPI is a one-wire serial interface, so it reads and writes on the same single pin. Test automation was a driving factor for the creation of the Portaprog. The portable ISP only did programming, and the initial version of the Portaprog also only did programming for SPI chips and UPDI chips, but I wanted to be able to do test automation. When I started the 2020 eChallenge coin, all I was focused on was programming, and when I started the 2021 eChallenge coin, I really wanted to make sure that I could verify all the hardware very easily at the bench, and so test automation was what I wanted to perform. So let's look at the files that are involved in setting up the Portaprog when I'm doing test automation. Yeah, of course, the config file here, going to connect to our Wi-Fi if it's available. Otherwise, it sets itself up as a hotspot. It'll then configure the connection for the UART between the attached device, in this case, the eChallenge coin, and the Portaprog. So that's the 9600 baud with a 500 millisecond timeout. And it will launch and execute the start file. This will actually perform initialization of other operations we want to do on the Portaprog happens each time the Portaprog is powered up. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to make sure that no power is attached to the device, so the eChallenge coin will be powered down. We set UPDI mode, and we preload the firmware. Now the firmware has been loaded from SPIFS to our in-memory buffer. We set button 1 to load and execute our smoke test, and for convenience purposes, I tend to set button 3 to power toggle. That smoke test that's being executed whenever we press button 1 is over on the right-hand side. And we can take a look at the commands that are going to be executed. So each time button 1 gets pressed, these commands will all execute in order. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to clear the UART connection between the Portaprog and the eChallenge coin. Make sure there's no data still residing there. It'll ensure that the power is off to the eChallenge coin. And it will set the programming mode to UPDI. Both of those are redundant with our start file, but it's just an easy way to make sure that everything's set the way we want. It'll clear the screen on the Portaprog. The right command will flash firmware to the attached device and then perform verification. And then mute on says no more information that the Portaprog may be generating on its own should go to the screen. And we clear the screen one more time. So at this point, the only thing that will appear on the screen of the Portaprog are messages that are coming from our smoke test process itself. As soon as we power on, issue that command, then the code, the firmware on the eChallenge coin will start to execute, and that is our smoke test code. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to wait up to five seconds to see if we receive the word buzzer. So that's what that test command is doing. Over in the smoke test itself, we can see we put an informational message on the display, LEDs and tone. Is it good? Press the wake button. Tells the user to press the wake button if they do hear the tone and see all the LEDs light. Assuming that is all successful, then we will output the message LED buzzer test, pass and fail. So you'll notice in our smoke test, we're looking for the word buzzer. So that now has been received. And so our test script will actually continue on. It's going to immediately send a piece of information over the UART using the UTEXT command. It will send the word UART. So that now has been sent from the Portaprog to our eChallenge coin. Whenever it goes to check its receive buffer on the UART, it will have that text waiting for it. Over in the script, we continue on. We want to do a calibration of the touch sensor. So we want to make sure that no touch sensors are being activated before we start the calibration. We just give a warning to the user if indeed we detect any. And then we perform the calibration itself. If all the values are within a known range, we'll mark that as pass. If they're slightly out of range, we can mark that as a warning. And if they're way out of range, then we can mark that as a fail. Typically, this is a pass-fail test. Uh, if a resistor is missing or has tombstoned on the printed circuit board, then that touch sensor will always be active. 
and so this will end up as a failure. As a sanity check, we do a test of our pseudo random generator, and then we test the IR transceiver. The programming jig that we're using for the 2020 Mini Challenge coin has an optical loopback on the IR transceiver. So if we transmit the IR test text, it'll actually sit on the receive side and we can immediately look for it. Inside our loop, we'll take a look. Have we received anything on the IR receive side? If we have, we'll compare that text against what we're looking for, which is the text IR test. If it matches, we're good. If it doesn't match, we'll discard it and we'll give ourselves a couple of more attempts at this test. Uh, we can loop through a few times. If we get to the end of all the iterations on this and we never receive cleanly IR test, then we'll mark this one fail. Otherwise, we can mark it as pass. Remember, over in our smoke test, we have transmitted using the utex command the text uart. And so we're going to take a look and see, has anything come in on our uart? The challenge coin says, yes, I've received something on the uart. I want to compare it to what I'm expecting, which is the word uart. And if it matches, then I know that that test has been successful. I can mark it as a pass-fail. And all of this loops a few times, so we have a couple of chances to get all these tests done. And then at the end of these loops, we test all the flags for each of the tests and verify that we've received a status on every test. If all of those tests were successful, then the code sets an EEPROM byte to one, which says, okay, the smoke test was successful. You can now switch from smoke test to production mode. And then we will transmit back over the UART to the port of prog smoke test pass or fail. Remember for the past six seconds, we've been looking for the word smoke test. Thankfully, this test runs much faster than I can talk. It will have received the word smoke test and then the script will just simply wait for 500 milliseconds and then power off the e-challenge coin and unmute the port of prog. Now let's actually take a look at the port of prog, the test jig, and the 2021 e-challenge coin and see this example execute. This will be done at the bench. So there's the port of prog in the jig e-challenge coin. You can see the wake button right there. There's the script we're going to be running. It's been assigned to button one. So every time we press button one, it will load and execute the script. So it's powered off the e-challenge coin. It has set it to UPDI mode. It has started the write operation. So we're flashing the firmware. As soon as the firmware has been flashed, we will start the verification process of the firmware. It will clear the screen and then it will power on the e-challenge coin and immediately start executing those commands. And we press OK, we're done, and all the tests have passed. Smoke test has passed and it has powered off the e-challenge coin. The bulk of the time is spent during the write operation. And we're back. In addition to the port prog itself, I've developed a jig adapter system the reason is, is because each one of my projects tends to have a custom printed circuit board and has different requirements for how it is interfaced. Here you see the 2020 eChallenge coin in black, the 2021 eChallenge coin there in white, the red is the eChallenge card, and the blue is the Smart Response XE device. Each one of these has a different way of being interfaced for programming and for test. So the eChallenge coins use the tabs around the perimeter. The eChallenge card uses a standard pin header the Smart Response XE device has a custom footprint under the case. Initially, I used cables for interfacing to the various printed circuit boards. So for the eChallenge coin in 2020, when I was doing the development, I created this little pigtail with a standard SPI connector on one end and a series of alligator clips on the other. These could be connected to the tabs around the perimeter of the eChallenge coin. And the standard pin header simply plugs into the end connector on the port prog and the port prog maintains a standard SPI 6-pin connector as the first portion of its header. When I moved from the portable ISP to the port prog I was able to bring along the QFP32 adapter. 
I have not recently used this adapter, as I now have the jig assembly that I'll be showing. And here is the tag connect cable that I use on my holiday ornaments. When programming and testing a large number of PCBs at a time, it's helpful to have a jig that does the alignment for me. So here is the reusable base, and this is the interface adapter for the 2020 eChallenge coin. It uses pogo pins for the SPI interface, and the portaprog slides into the side and interfaces to the little adapter board. Then it's simply a matter of lifting the arm, placing in the printed circuit board, closing the arm, and then pressing the program smoke test button. Once the port prog has been configured for another project, it's a matter of simply sliding out the adapter. So now we'll slide in the adapter for the 2021 eChallenge coin. You can see it actually has a little insert, which will auto-align against the battery holder. Place in the printed circuit board, lock it down, slide in the port prog and we're ready to start programming the 2021 eChallenge coin. This one actually has that little optical loop back for the IR transceiver. The port prog jig actually has two locations for clamping. So for the eChallenge coins, the clamp is in the lower position. For the eChallenge card, the clamp is in the upper position. While I could move the clamp between the two, I've just printed another base. Now we'll insert the adapter for the eChallenge card. The little black U you see at the bottom is actually its optical loopback because the IR transceiver is located at the bottom of the card. Place the card in, clamp it down, and once again we just slide the portaprog into its position and now we can start programming the eChallenge card. Finally we have the eChallenge console project which is the upscaling of the Smart Response XE device and I have printed an adapter for it. It uses a series of pogo pins aligned to a custom footprint that is inside the Smart Response XE device and is accessed through a series of holes in the battery compartment. Drop the device in, clamp it into position, and we're ready to start. So this is the ecosystem that I have created for the port prog jigs consisting of a standard base with two clamp locations, interchangeable adapters, one for each of the projects as I create them, the eChallenge card, the 2021 eChallenge coin, the 2020 eChallenge coin, the eChallenge console, and the cables. So what's next for the port prog the real question is, is it a product? Is it a prototype? Is it an exercise left for the reader? While I like the TT Go T display, it requires too many bodges and the assembly process, while I have been successful at creating 10 or 15 of them, it's time consuming and it's error prone. I am hoping that Adafruit will be releasing later this year, a new feather, an ESP32 with the display already integrated and three buttons. If this becomes available, I will likely port the port prog to this device and find a way to get by with just the three buttons. Another option I've played with is creating my own custom board. Uh, this would use a sharp memory display, so that's a 400 by 240 monochrome display. And a third option I'm investigating is Dustin Watts' Touchdown, which is a touch deck with uh, a 480 by 320 and touchscreen. And hopefully one of those three options will work out in the meantime. You're welcome to create your own port prog All the code is open source and available. And if you have any requests or find a bug, pull requests are encouraged. And there you have it, the port prog a portable ISP and UDPI programmer for both development and production. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter, and don't forget to check out the open source at GitLab Braden Lane port prog